Well, good evening. Welcome to the 2021 Delaware Mini Medical School, uh, jointly produced by the Delaware Academy of Medicine, Delaware Public Health Association, and Christiana Care. We're delighted uh, to have you all joining us in this virtual environment. I hope that your uh, last year of COVID pandemic has uh, not been too terribly distressing, although it certainly has been a challenge for all of us in medicine and in public health and certainly you in the community. Uh, my name is Tim Gibbs, Executive Director, and uh, let me click on the correct screen so I can actually advance. So about Mini Medical School, we're going to be meeting for six consecutive weeks. At the conclusion, if you've attended all of the classes, and you will be able to view these online afterwards recorded, uh, you will be eligible to receive a certificate of attendance, which will be emailed to you upon request. That says mailed, it'll be emailed. Uh, there is no continuing medical education credit offered with this series. And attending many medical school does not qualify you for any job, but it does look great on a college application. A um, little bit of housekeeping, there will be a presentation. Uh, perhaps there will be a brief break, uh, perhaps not, but then there will be the presentation conclusion and Q&A. And what Dr. Bonner, our presenter for this evening, requests is that you go ahead and put your questions into the chat as uh, she does her presentation, and she may very well respond to them on the fly. Uh, for Q&A, please try not to ask uh, questions uh, that are personal health questions and do ask questions that are on topic for the presentation. There will be an evaluation after this. Uh, for all of you, uh, we'll be sending an email with a link to a SurveyMonkey evaluation. Completing this forum helps us in improving Minimed and provides feedback to our faculty speakers. Uh, PowerPoint presentations and the videos will be posted to DelawareMinimed.org within a couple of days of the presentation. And at this point, I'm going to introduce this evening's speaker. And I need to just pull something over here. So uh, Diane Bonner, MD, FACP, is the Medical Director for Patient and Family-Centered Care and Resource Management at Christiana Care. She is also an attending physician in the Adult Medicine Office at the Wilmington Hospital Health Center. A graduate of Eastern Virginia Medical School, Dr. Bonner completed her residency in internal medicine at Christiana Care in 1996 and has worked in the health system ever since. Previously, Dr. Bonner was medical director and physician advisor to the Department of Utilization Management. Currently, she serves as chair of the Utilization uh, Review Committee. From 1977 till 2006, Dr. Bonner worked in private practice as an internal medicine specialist for the Lancaster Pike Medical Group. During this time, she participated in the Practicing Physician Education product, uh, Project, sponsored by the American Geriatric Society and the John A. Hartford Foundation, a project that involved training physicians to present community workshops on geriatric issues. Dr. Bonner is especially interested in geriatrics and gives, has given presentations and a wide range of topics related to gerontology. As a physician staff faculty member for Christiana Care, Dr. Bonner has taught internal medicine residents through all phases of their training. Dr. Bonner's other responsibilities include teaching residents about ambulatory internal medicine and training them in the out, uh, outpatient clinic. Dr. Bonner is also clinical instructor of medicine affiliated with the Jefferson Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, now called the Sidney Kimmel Medical College, I believe. Christiana Care is awarded Dr. Bonner and her teammates numerous Focus on Excellent awards for her work in areas such as addressing the needs of long stay patients, improving patient flow, and identifying areas, uh, identifying patients who are at risk for readmission before discharge. And Dr. Bonner is a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Dr. Bonner, welcome. Normally we would do applause. And I'm not sure how many people we have here, but the uh, for you all online, almost 500 people registered uh, for one session or another, and you might all be here. It would be thunderous applause, but Dr. Bonner, 
I will now turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, just give me a second. Thank you, Tim. Let me... All right, Tim, was that successful? That was perfect, thank you. Excellent, that's always a good sign. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank you brave folks who have your videos on um, when I, um, during the day and I'm working and I have meetings at Christiana Care, a lot of times nobody will turn their video on and I feel like I'm talking to, I don't know, a wall or a computer and I find that very difficult. Um, first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself, and then um, I'll talk about where we hope to go with the presentation. Um, as Tim said, I've been um, with Christiana Care since 1996, um, which is a really long time, um, although it doesn't feel like that. The time goes really quickly. And one thing I was aware of as Tim was talking about my journey is that I really like to do new and different things. And so I was in primary care for about 10 years. I've always taught residents. And it was in that resident setting where I, I alongside of the residents would see patients come in that really, it was obvious that the traditional office medical setting for primary care wasn't meeting the needs of those patients. And I worked in that office um, for quite a long time, um, actually from when I graduated um, to maybe about six or seven years ago. And um, really that's when my love of working with um, people that were just super complicated in their life um, that's when my I found that passion and that's what I love to do. And Christiana, working at Christiana Care has really afforded me to explore um, this area and to do new and different things. So we'll talk about that um, as we go along the way. Um, I do encourage you, please put in questions. I can't see the questions, um, but Dr. Smith is gonna help me out with that. And I'd love to answer questions as we go along the way. So these days currently, I am working system-wide with what we call complex care or the complex patient. And this is a relatively new coined term. Um, although the patient or the person with these types of struggles is indeed not new at all. Um, it's as if part of the, if you were reading through the medical literature, um, that this epiphany has occurred um, in parts of the medical community, um, but those of us who have been working um, in the struggle with this type of um, person um, have been well aware of it for a long time. So we're going to talk about the art and practice of complex care. All right, so we're gonna do a little bit of the agenda. I'm gonna talk about the definition. I'm gonna talk about the components of complex care and the needs of people that we sort of label, although I, I, I don't like labeling people, um, but they're people who struggle with complex issues. What are the goals of complex care? Um, and I have some, some stories, some patient stories and some stories of some folks. Uh, talk about, and then we'll talk about how do we serve the population or these folks better. Now you'll see, I'm gonna really try not to use some of the terminology. Um, in some ways it comes with its own language, medicine comes with its own language and working in complex patients come with its own language. So if I say something that's not really clear, please absolutely, um, uh, raise your hand, and I see there's one hand raised there already, um, or type in a, 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 a message so we can clarify along the way. And Kimberly, you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Kimberly, we're going to keep all our participants on mute just so that there's no extra talking. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat, and I'll read it out to Dr. Boner, okay? 
Okay, so I won't have people um, uh, talk about, um, they can't talk spontaneously, okay. All right, so what is complex care? And, and uh, what, do, what do I mean when I talk about complex care? And complex care has a definition, right? It's complex care is a person-centered approach to address the needs of people whose combinations of medical, behavioral health, and social challenges result in extreme patterns of healthcare utilization and cost. So let's go back because I said I was going to be using some terms that may not be used every day or that we might be using or see every day, but we're not really clear on the meaning. So we use the word person centered. Um, it used to be called patient center, um, but then we realized, right, people aren't always patients, but they are always people and they're always persons. Um, and what is a person centered care? approach mean, and it means that we've sat down and we've involved somebody, um, a person and their family as part of the care team, as we create a relationship and learn what that person's goals with their lives are. Because the reality of it is that as a physician, my goal for you may be very different than what your goal is for you in your life. And if I just think you're gonna do what I tell you to do because I think that should be your goal, then we're going to fail in taking care of people. So it's really about engaging with people and understanding their world and their desires and where they want to go um, with their healthcare and some other components of this. And this, this is really critical. Um, I can't tell you how many times um, I used to, when I was in primary care practice, I used to have a woman um, who was a native of, uh, from um, Korea and she had diabetes and her, di her diabetic doctor, so high blood sugars, kept telling her not to eat rice, but there was no way in her diet that she was not going to eat rice. So she would make up her blood sugar numbers and those were the numbers she would give to her doctor. And there was absolutely nothing therapeutic about that relationship um, because she didn't want to let him down. Um, so she just made it up and lied to him. And so when we talk about person-centered, that's what I'm what that's what I'm talking about. Um, and then you'll see over in the corner or over on this side of the slide, we're talking medical conditions. And I'll talk about the medical conditions that we see. Um, that a lot of people have, um, and they, they are the same medical conditions that the, this group of people get that we're talking about. But unique to this population are more severe psychiatric illnesses, um, and we're not talking about sort of anxiety and depression. Lots of people have anxiety or depression or sadness at some point in their life. Um, it's it's a, a natural part of lots of people's lives. We're talking about more severe mental illness, or we're talking about severe substance um, use. Um, and we'll talk about what we see in the community these days. And then along with it, right, we have struggling social and environmental changes. And the phrase that we use here are the social determinants of health. And we'll get a little bit um, deeper into that as well. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. So let's start, it's, it's funny because I, I, part of this will show you what my view is on working with a population that struggles with all of these areas, is that we're gonna talk about the, what factors impact health. So when I look at somebody and I'm, and if I had to guess and say, what kind of factors in your world help to make you healthy or keep you from being healthy, there's different factors that play into that. And there's a pie chart and it, it, it always surprises me because it's not what as a physician I would think were the major factors that play into your life. So 
when I was in training, um, right, it was all about clinical care, right? We can make people healthier just by delivering good clinical care. But when you look in this chart, and you'll see that clinical care really um, contributes about 20% to, to a person's health, which is, is really um, surprising if, like I said, when I was training, it was a physician oriented or a provider oriented perspective. And we thought we could really make a big difference in people's lives. But in, re in reality, there's lots of other things going on outside of the doctor's office that contributes to somebody's health. So you see, right, 30% here is health behaviors. And these are things like exercise and smoking um, and diet and you know, obesity, right? So there's health behaviors. 10% is the physical environment that somebody lives in. What is their home? What is their, um, what is their neighborhood situation? And then 40% are these socioeconomic factors. And it wasn't so long ago that healthcare really thought that it was not our responsibility to get into these social factors. Now, thankfully that has changed. And you may say to me, you've seen these um, pies shaped before and they may vary a little bit in percentages depending on um, where you look online and take a look at it. Um, but, and I just picked one of them, but all of them sort of show this really, the importance of um, the social health in people's overall health. So what are the social determinants of health? And again, if you went online and you typed it in, you'd see all different um, areas and definitions of it. Um, but really what we're looking at is a constellation of um, these six areas, we call them domains, but these six areas. Um, for somebody to be healthy, they need to have access to quality health care. And, you know, we are one of the wealthiest nations in the world, and we have some really poor access to health care in areas. So, for instance, if you are living in the city of Wilmington, and I don't know if you guys know, but where Wilmington Hospital is just off of 95, everything from Wilmington Hospital east towards the river there's really poor access to healthcare. So anybody who's living in those areas cannot easily access healthcare. There's no urgent care centers, um, need to be able to have transportation, need to be able to figure out where they can go for their health. Um, and, and they need to be able to address their health around hours in which they're working or going to school. But that is one of those areas that we, we call a, that is a healthcare desert. Um, and it's really impressive. If you count the urgent care centers around from Wilmington Hospital East, if you wanna to go to an urgent care center, you have to go up onto Concord Pike um, to reach a urgent, um, an urgent care health center. So if you look statistically, lots of people will say, oh, there's an urgent care center within five miles of everybody. They don't understand how 95 bisects the city of Wilmington and the steps that go into getting somebody from the city of Wilmington over to an urgent care. Um, it, it really is quite dramatic and difficult. So let's talk about community and social contact. Um, and this is the social supports. So with this is, do you have family? Do you have close friends around you um, who can help you and support you, right? Life has its up and ups and downs and everybody struggles, um, but it's really that connectedness with other people, with our families, with our extended families, the people we choose to be a part of our families, our churches, our community centers. Um, and when those relationships become fractured, it has a large impact on health. 
Um, we talk about food quality and stability. Um, I was talking about that area from Wilmington Hospital East. That is also a food desert. Um, there are not, um, there's not food stores. There's little bodegas. They don't have fresh fruits and vegetables, but there's not really a food store until you get on Route 13 um, where there's a shop right down there. So we have food accessibilities um, in Delaware as well, which you think, you know, we're the wealthiest nation. We, we shouldn't have um, those, um, those deserts. Education, right? Everyone should have access to um, a, a good solid education. There's certain things that when you graduate high school, um, you should be able to go to a safe high school. You should be able to learn certain things, particularly you should be able to read, um, do math. I mean, there's certain things you should be able to do and you should be able to graduate help, um, high school. Um, and we know that there are, depending on which high school you go to in the state of Delaware, that your experience can be dramatically different. And um, what you've learned when you've come out um, it is completely different. And I, I can tell you, I have, a, I work with a fair number of people that maybe drop out at 11th or 12th grade, but surprisingly, they their reading level is not anywhere what you would expect a high school student level to be at. Um, so it's access to education, but it's also the quality of that education as well. Dr. Bonner, yeah. we have a question oh. in the chat. Okay. If, uh, and this is regarding access to healthcare. Why doesn't Christiana Care open an urgent care center east of the hospital? So you know what? That's a that's a very good question. Um, and I know that people have looked at those options. Christiana, um, well, I, I mean, I don't get to make those decisions. So um, that's one thing. But Christiana, right, is in partnership with, oh, it just escapes me, the name of the, the urgent care centers. And there, there isn't one. Um, and there, you know, there should be an urgent care. And then, you know, it gets a little trickier because you get into some of those areas and to put an urgent care or the medical um, uh, facility in there, right? There's a lot of safety issues um, that arise with it and it gets complicated. I'm not saying it shouldn't happen because I totally think it should, um, but there's business um, thoughts that go into it as well. Would that be Go Health? Go health. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Go health. Someone I, in the chat put it in. So I'm glad they knew. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I love when people help me out like that. And then we're going to talk a little bit of economic stability because I drilled down a little bit into economic stability in one of my slides to give you sort of some real life examples. And I used, um, when I talk about the city of Wilmington, I used the city of Wilmington in the area, thinking that a lot of folks on here might be from Newcastle County. But as I talk about deserts and places that really suffer from social economic issues, think about the city of Wilmington as I talked about it, then Newcastle as you come down the Route 9 quarter. So that has to do with immigration of folks from the city down into Newcastle. Um, those are really hard stricken areas. Also the Dover area, when you get down to Dover and then Western Sussex County, you see a lot of the same thing. And there's definitely, I could talk about either one of those areas, like I'm going to talk about um, the city of Wilmington. And then of course we have neighbor, neighborhoods and physical environments. Um, if you ever, you know, have had listened to some folks who have lived in the areas east of Wilmington, whether it be Southbridge, there's, there's some different areas. Um, that's, you know, there's shootings, there's a lot of violence. Um, I've had uh, patients say to me, I can't really think about my health care because every night I have to put my children into the bathtub to keep them safe from the bullets that are outside my door, right? So it, it's it, the neighborhood and the physical environment and the safety and the presence of drugs and, you know, perhaps an environment that's not really conducive um, to feeling safe and secure and being everything that you can be. Okay, so this is where I talked about the drill down. And it's very interesting. I, I just find it fascinating. The difference between 
if you look, a lot of the data will talk about Newcastle County as a whole for those social determinants of health that we just talked about. But you remember Newcastle County, right? So everything sort of from Middletown above has really, is, is really variable in um, the social vulnerability. So Newcastle County, right, has Greenville and Centerville, right, pockets where people have money and access to everything, right? We have all those private schools, right? They're not socially vulnerable, um, but there's areas that are very socially vulnerable and they get averaged together when you look at Newcastle County as a whole. So if you look at the Newcastle County data, sometimes it doesn't look that bad, but in reality, when you drill down to particular areas, um, and I'm gonna talk about census tracts, you can even see a disparity in the um, expected lifespan. And so I found this, and you have to dig really hard to find this information. So this is by census tract. And what do I mean by census tract? It has to do with the government, right? And when they come through and take the census, sen census, I don't know what the plural of census is, so census, and they delineate areas that are about, you know, they can vary in size, but they're small. So we're gonna talk about one that's 0. 0.6 and they put, and each one of them is numbered. And so they take the census and they can give you the public health data down to the, the square blocks that are in that census area. And so I pulled out one. So this is the, let me find my pointer here. So, right, so this, these are the census tracks. This is Wilmington, right? So this is the curve up here, the top of Delaware. This is the city of Wilmington. Um, this over here is in New Jersey. So you see, right, there's um, some highly, some high social needs over here. And then I happened to drill down it. I just picked one, right? Um, and I actually thought I was going into the city of Wilmington, but I wasn't when I picked this triangle one here. And what I did was pull this, the data for this little triangle here, and it's only 0.6 square miles. And this is where 295 crosses Route 13, so just out of the city, but it's actually Newcastle, right near the Delaware Psychiatric Center. Um, and it's, um, so it's just this little tiny area here. And I pulled the data for that. So it's over here and surrounded by areas that aren't quite as bad as it is, but this one's, this area struggles. And how do they struggle? I picked to drill down in the economics because the reality of it is, is if you don't make, enough money or you don't have enough money, then everything in life becomes difficult, right? That's the world we live in. And so for that tiny little triangle area, the per capita income, so per person income is $21,000, right? So I put it in that's 1767 a month, okay? The median household income is 52,000, but for this, for this particular area, there are at least three people in a household. Because as you can imagine, if you're making $1,700 a month, it's very difficult to pay rent and we'll get into that. So here's 3.3, .3. I don't know how you get 3.3 .3 person, but that's averaged out um, in a household. And 13%, so right, that's one in six, people live below poverty. Now, what are we saying when you live below the poverty line? Um, which I think is, is set really low if, um, if you've ever tried to live on very little money. So the I put thought that the poverty lines are here, right? For one person, if you are considered to be living in poverty, you're making $13,000 a year. Right, so that's only right a little bit over a thousand dollars a month. So if you're making twelve hundred dollars a month, you're not considered to be living in poverty. Um, and 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 like I said, we're going to get into the causes of the cost of houses in Delaware, which is very high rent. 
um, and very difficult to live on these. So even if you're not considered to be living in poverty, there's a huge gap where you, you still make more money than, than, a po than being labeled with poverty that is very difficult to live in. So let's talk about rents. So I love it when my son always says to me, I have a 13 year old son and I have a 15 year old daughter. And it's my daughter, my son who can't wait to get out and get his own apartment. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I don't think financially he might quite understand um, the cost of having an apartment, but we're talking about Newcastle County, right? And the fair market for a two bedroom apartment in Newcastle County is $1,000, right? 1077. So if you were to have a minimum wage job, it would take, you'd have to work 2.9 jobs to be able to afford the rent and the rest of your life in, 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 in Newcastle County. This is Newcastle County. So an affordable rent for a low income family, the poverty levels that we looked at would be $603. So if you take a look at this where we said in that little triangle, folks are making $1,700 a month. If you take away the rent, that leaves them $690 a month to do absolutely everything else. And $690 is not, it's a fair amount of money, but when you're paying bills, when you're paying for your car and your transportation and your gas um, and your clothing and your kid's school, um, and you're, you know, the stuff that you need to go to work. Oh, and then there's food, right? Yet you'll have to eat. You can see how um, ha these low incomes and these rents are too high to be able to survive on. Let's see if I put this in here. I did not. So what the estimate is, is that if you are in a position where you have to spend more than 50% of your income on rent, then you don't have enough money to make it through the rest of the month. And so we have a real crisis where we don't have enough affordable units for the incomes that we have in some of these areas. And then we wonder why people who can't afford everyday life things, why their health is so poor. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So let's switch over to medical conditions. And I always think this is, to me, this is the easiest part of that, that, um, that Venn diagram, right? Where we had um, social, medical, and um, psychiatric. The medical is actually pretty easy because the medical for these folks looks like the medical for everybody else, right? We see a lot of high blood pressure, right? And high blood pressure is, um, with age or with genetics, right, where your arteries um, get stiff and need to have medication to help bring that blood pressure down. And if not, you um, end up with difficulties such as having a stroke, right, where part of your brain doesn't get enough blood to your brain and you might lose the most frequent one is um, one side of your body that doesn't have strength or movement or heart disease. We have high blood sugar, right? So diabetes, which also leads to uncontrolled stroke, heart disease like heart attacks and kidney disease. A lot of people will end up on dialysis. We see lung diseases like emphysema from smoking because we see high smoking rates. Um, and in the areas that we talk about, folks have these diagnoses and these medical conditions, again, ubiquitous, right? We see it everywhere in the adult population, but they have the side effects and the consequences at an earlier age because they have reduced access to medical care, reduced access to healthy food, and they, they, they can't in their life make the adjustments to live healthier. So they get sicker sooner um, they have heart attacks at the age of, I mean, ridiculous ages, 30, 35, dialysis, um, where they have to replace, take your blood out and take all the toxins out because your kidneys don't work at very early ages. So although the medical conditions are the same, they are not as well controlled. 
So, and this is, I brought in, these are the causes of death for Newcastle County. And again, if, or if you look at the city of Wilmington and Newcastle County, they look the same, right? Diseases of the heart. We have some cancers. Cerebrovascular disease is strokes, um, accidents, diabetes is high blood sugar, but what it doesn't give you is the age and the complication rate. So you have to watch what you're actually looking at um, because the age and the complication rates differ greatly. As I said before, or I alluded to before, the lifespan of folks who live in these impoverished areas is lower than folks who do not within the state of Delaware. Okay, so I have to make sure, cause I could talk about this stuff forever. Um, so this is census track 156. So this is the same census track and this is the adjusted cancer rate. And this is, I wanted to show you this one too. So this is the same census track as before this little triangle that we were talking about the socioeconomics to where the surrounding areas as you get out here have fewer or, or have no significantly significant difference in their rate of cancers, you can see that when we start to drill down in these census tracts, we do have different rates of cancer. Um, and if I, they, there are significantly higher rates. If we looked at, this is an act, some of this is an access to healthcare issue, right? So the things we do to, to catch cancer early are things like mammograms for breast cancer, um, are things like colonoscopies, right, for colon cancer, um, or pap smears, um, where we take some of the cervical cells in women for cervical cancer and access to care um, and um, understanding of healthcare prevention varies greatly when you drill down to census tract. Okay. So behavioral health conditions. Um, I assume there's no questions, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, nope, no questions, I will, okay. I, I promise I'll stop you. <laughs> okay, like I said, I could, I, I, could talk, I, I could talk about this forever. Actually, there, there was a question that was answered in the chat that maybe if you'd like to talk about it, um, someone asked the, the darker colors on those maps represent higher social vulnerability. That was the, the question. Correct. So the, and I didn't get into it gets because it gets into, um, there's a social vulnerability index um, that is a standard across the country that measures 12 areas of social needs and economic needs. And when they go through and they take all the census information, they calculate it for each one of these areas and darker is worse. Okay, so behavioral health. So if you're lucky in your life, um, you will not have any up close experience with what, what is called severe mental illness or severe persistent mental illness. And that's really the type of mental illness I'm talking about here. So I'm talking about schizophrenia, right? Which means break from reality right? It's a disruption in the way that the thinking goes in the brain. And so the, the folks that have uncontrolled schizophrenia, their perception of reality, which is very real to them, it's not normal, right? If you took folks without this, the way that they perceived what was going on in the world and the way people were interacting with them looks very different from the person with schizophrenia. And so schizophrenics generally are folks that hear voices and they're very real to them and it may be more than one. And I can tell you in all of the schizophrenics I've talked to, none of the voices are nice. They're demeaning voices. Um, so they have to put up all day long with a voice telling them how horrible they are for the most part, it's awful. Or they can see things that are really not there. Um, which can you imagine be really scary if you see things and you're paying attention, um, but other people aren't seeing it and you can't figure out what's real and what's not real. We're talking about bipolar disorder pe people. 
And these are folks that suffer from mania and depression swings, and that can vary. Um, and mania, right? These are the folks that have all the energy, don't have to sleep at night, super productive, and they can get up at like three o'clock in the morning and clean their houses and all of that. So they're, they're, they're really moving really quickly and getting stuff done and spending lots of money and they're online and um, they have lots of boyfriends or girlfriends and they're out. Um, and then the, then accompany a downswing and have a depression swing um, where all of a sudden they can't move and they get out of bed. And so folks with severe bipolar, we see a lot of post-traumatic stress disorders. And um, right, and these are, 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 are really dramatic um, from severe childhood and from ongoing trauma. Now I'm assuming that everybody on here is high school student or older. And so I, I will share with you when I first started really working with a patient group that was um, this type of patient, I, I would come out of the day and I would be super sad. These are folks that have been sexually and physically abused since the age of three, four, five, six, seven. I mean, things that nobody should ever have to put up with um, and abandonment issues, um, and marginalization and racism. And so they carry these traumas with them and they've had to figure out these coping mechanisms just to get through that part of their life. And then those coping mechanisms don't really function well in their current state. And so the consequences of uncontrolled serious mental illness, right? It stresses the families out. And what you see is a complete fracture in family, community, and workplace relationships. So I alluded a little bit earlier that the connectedness is really important to people's health and they lose this because of uncontrolled psychiatric conditions. Um, and if you are stuck in a place where you don't have access to healthcare, then it stays uncontrolled um, and, and, and that just gets worse. Dr. Dr. Bonner. Yeah. You might not be the person to answer this question, but there are a couple questions in the chat asking if these types of be, uh, behavioral disorders are something people are born with or if they can develop them as they grow. Um, so I'm not, I don't take care of kids, um, but frequently when they manifest themselves, um, they're not, and, and they manifest as teenagers or later, depending on the, um, depending on which disorder that we're talking about. And you're not born with post-traumatic stress disorder, right? That is just a life experience. Um, you can, uh, um, you know, there are young people with bipolar disorders that you have, um, but it depends on your environment that you're in as well and how supportive you are. And schizophrenics, you generally see um, in their late teens and their early 20s is, is generally the earliest they break. Um, but again, I'm not a pediatrician. I think all young kids should be healthy. Um, but there, and there are, I'm sure there's some folks that have these pediatric conditions, but you, they're not seen nearly as frequently as you see them in young adults and older folks. And then real quick, speaking about um, environmental issues, there was a question about people who are hoarders. That seems yeah. to cut across the socioeconomic classes. Has anyone figured out a way to help them? Um, does Christiana Care do anything with people who have that condition? Um, I work with a number of hoarders. Um, and it is very, very difficult um, to, usually they're older folks um, that are hoarders. And we do have, you can, as a hoarder, be in therapy. A lot of this, and a lot of these respond very well to therapy, but you wanna have to participate in it. Um, but um, hoarding is a very difficult um, uh, behavior. Um, to address. And you have, again, you have to get at the root cause of it. And then you have to start to unpack and, and have new coping skills moving forward. And then we have a couple of follow up to, to follow up. You started it. You said I could ask That's the okay. questions. That's okay. I'd rather <laughs> just be interactive. Um, so we have question, what about narcissistic behavior? And then a second question, what's the likelihood that someone with SMI slash SPMI 
know that they have these behavioral health issues or does this differ based on the specific diagnosis? Um, okay, so the, tell me what the first one was again. The no, question just, was just narcissistic just behavior. Oh, narcissistic behavior. Okay, so narcissism, and hopefully you guys get to have a psychiatric like presentation at some point. And I'm an internist by training. I should have told you that before. I am not a psychiatrist, but I do work with a lot of folks that have these issues. And narcissism is a personality disorder when it gets classified. And personality disorders, um, again, require a lot of therapy. And when I talk about therapy, we're talking about um, cognitive therapy, talk therapy, um, to really, right? People have different awarenesses of their um, level of illness, and they have to want to do the work to be able to change and learn behaviors to change those. Personality disorders, a lot of therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, the SPMI and the SMI, so it can vary. I have had people that absolutely do not believe that they have a behavioral health issue and have had an extreme schizophrenia. I, I have a couple of those right now. Um, and even in the face of consequences. So um, the, I'm not thinking about a particular patient now who has been in the psychiatric facilities multiple times, um, has been injured, right? Has been assaulted, all related to his behavioral health, but doesn't recognize at all that there's an issue. Um, and part of our jobs as we work on with these, these people is to work with them. We use the phrase, we go to where the patient is. So if I'm working with Kate and she completely doesn't accept that she has a behavioral health problem, but she's willing to come see me because she has high blood pressure, I'm gonna take that opportunity to develop a relationship with her and then to continue to have conversations to see if I can get her to start to understand that the other aspects of what's going on in her life. And maybe if she trusts me, she'll start to open up and she'll start to move along and be able to make some changes in her life. Um, so they're completely variable and there's absolutely people that know they're, they're bipolar um, and want help for it. The same thing with schizophrenia, they'll come in, they'll say, you know, I've been diagnosed with schizophrenia and I really want help because this is not the way I wanna live my life. People are at all places along the spectrum um, you know, much like we're all at a different place along the spectrum of how much we should be exercising, right? Um, so it, it's just like everything else and really is individualized as we work with people. Um, right, when you have an uncontrolled serious mental illness, it's very hard to keep employment. Then, it's, then it leads to homelessness or near homelessness. When I say near homelessness, right, Homelessness, living on the street, going to a shelter at night, near homelessness, mm, couch surfing, staying with different people, living on their couches, living in a car. There's different ways you can be near homeless, but boy, they're so close to being homeless that we need to interview, inter, um, intervene soon. And there are targets for others, right? When you're on the street and you have a severe mental health, you're a target to be robbed, you're a target to be assaulted, um, to take advantage of, we see it all the time. Um, and the way that your brain is working, right? It, you, you can't really navigate traditional medical systems for healthcare. I'll talk about it a little bit more. And you suffer from stigmatism and marginalization, right? Everybody's like, oh, can you see that person, right? See, they're crazy. Um, or society gets them marginalized. So then they have that experience on top of it. Let's talk substances for a minute. Another topic we could go for like an hour on, but we're seeing, right? I see a ton of heroin use, right? In my whole life, I don't think I ever thought I'd be seeing as much heroin use, fentanyl use and opioid use, right? So we see a lot of heroin smoked and injected. Um, we see a lot of street or per prescription opioids. And when I say that, I'm talking about like per painkillers, right? Percocet, that sort of thing. Intentional and unintentional fentanyl. 
I don't know how many times I have to explain to somebody that if they're buying a drug on the street, it's, it's as likely to not be the drug they think they're buying and that it has fentanyl um, in it. Um, and this is one of the reasons it kills people. We see alcoholism. We've always had alcohol problems. Um, and we see cocaine and marijuana. And quite truthfully, when I see cocaine and marijuana alone, I'm actually kind of happy because they're much easier to deal with than alcohol and um, the opioids. And what's the consequences of addiction? If you've ever had to, had an, um, a person with a, you don't know, use the addiction, but substance use disorder in your family, right? You know, addiction's not fun. When you're addicted to something, you need to have that drug just to feel normal. You're not even trying to get high anymore. So these folks get up in the morning and the first thing they need to do is figure out what substance they need so that they can feel normal and face the world. Um, there's theft, there's sexual exchange for drugs, right? We have no money, we have to find other ways to exchange. So very frequently you have folks with high risk sexual activity, you have overdose, um, intentional and unintentional, and a lot of stigmatism, um, stigmatism, hmm, a lot of stigma, I don't think stigmatism is the right word, and marginalization with this population as well. All right, so I put a little bit in here because now I get into zip codes. You can't always get the data down, um, but this is, right, the reported prescription use in eighth graders in public school in Delaware, this is Newcastle County, um, within the year 2016 to 2017. And the literature, if you read through it, will tell you that um, painkiller use in this group um, starts addiction. And actually a lot of it came from the use in the dentist's office. Um, and then if you look, right, again, the darker, the higher the rate of use. And you see, this is the same area we were talking about before. Um, and this is actually all of Newcastle here. Right, so three to almost 5% of individuals eighth grade in public school have tried and used painkillers. Um, so that to me is scary. Um, this is a little bit about opioid-related opioid deaths. Um, and here's the, Delaware, here's the Delaware benchmark and here's the actual result. Are opioid-related deaths, again, fentanyl, heroin, Percocet are off the charts, all right? And I think what that says to me is, you know what? We need a different way of talking about drug use and, and addressing it with individuals in, a, in a, a less marginalized way. Um, and so we could get all, we could totally talk about this forever um, but when I'm talking to folks, it's, uh, you know, if they don't want to quit, I don't end the conversation, right? I talk about how can we reduce the use? Uh, we have tips on how to use safely for individuals who aren't going to quit. Um, but we are not doing a very good job um, with our opioid um, overdoses, deaths in Delaware. So what happens? So we call this the struggles. Right? When you have a medical problem, you have a social problem, and you have a behavioral health problem, all of them different varying degrees, and, and some might be sort of stable, and then they're not, and then they change. And, and, and with my teams, we call it the struggles, and we'll say, you know, they're just deep in the struggle. And how do you break the cycle of that struggle, and, and, and how do you break it not just short term, but how do you break it in a long term way? And that's what we try to do. Um, and so you see this here. So this is my sort of circle here, right? If you have an uncontrolled psychiatric or substance use disorder and you don't get adequate treatment and then your friends can't put up with you anymore and they abandon you and then you lose your job because you can't hold down a job because you have an uncontrolled um, psychiatric disorder, then you can't pay for anything, right? You can't pay your bills, your medications, your car, healthy food. You're getting, you're, you're, you're not being treated very nicely in the community, right? And you've got poor control of your medical conditions because you can't, you're not thinking straight. You can't access anything. You don't have any help from anybody and you have no money. And this, and then, right, 
when you get into this, you think I should just use again because my life is awful, right? It's easier to stay in this than it is to try to figure out how to get out. And so what my teams do is come in and say, right, how can we work with you in these different areas to try to disrupt this and give you a chance to get from drowning and underwater to above water where you can start to sort of self-manage, right? Where you can take care of your own life and your own health. So what are the goals of complex care of working with these folks? And I would say the most important part is establishing a trusting relationship. The folks that have been in the struggles have been treated so poorly that they're just, they don't trust you. You know, there's, people will say to me, well, he's paranoid, he must be a schizophrenic. And I'll say, well, we need to take a look at their life because some of that paranoia may absolutely be reasonable based on that person's experience. And so how do we meet somebody and treat them with respect and have conversation and let them know that we're there with them and to help them through good decisions and bad decisions, right? Like, I wish I made good decisions all the time, but I don't, and neither does everybody. We have to understand the holistic life of the person. It's that whole person-centeredness. Understand the goals. What does that person want out of their life, right? So some people want to go back to work. Some people want to be able to get around their neighborhood and visit people. Everybody has a different goal in their life, but what is the person you're trying to work with? And we support self-management. How can we work with you to know how to negotiate the systems to get the care that you need? And if you're not able to self-manage, how can we put in long-term supports to help you, right? And you have to have a tremendous amount of patience right? Tolerance, flexibility, and creativity. These are folks that don't show up to their appointments. They're folks that show up late to their appointments. There are folks that show up, right? And, and for a lot of reasons, whether it's transportation, whatever it is, um, they make bad decisions like the rest of us make bad decisions. And we have to be there to say, yeah, you know, that might not have been the decision that I would have made, but I'm not abandoning you because you made that decision. We're tremendously flexible, and I'll talk about that in the programs. And we get creative, right? Like, if we can't figure out a solution, like, how can we think of something new and out of the box that can support this person? What does this person, what does this individual person need that will assist in their long term stability? So, Dr. Bonner, there's a question in the chat. In establishing trust, shouldn't we take it where they are most comfortable? Would that be part of thinking outside the box? Shouldn't we take what? It said it. So okay. Blythe, if you want to, if you want to maybe ask more of your question, uh, if you want to continue, Dr. Bonner, I'll, I'll butt in again once. Okay. The because this has... is very important. You're right. And, 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 and I might actually be able to answer that, right? We find that some people are more comfortable with a video visit, if we can arrange that, because they're in their own home or they're comfortable with a in-home visit, or they're comfortable with having their best friend with them. And so the physical location and the mannerisms, some people may want a particular gender or particular race, um, and, and they control, right? They always have the right to say, I don't wanna discuss that, right? So you say, you know, do, we, do you mind if we talk about your alcohol use? And if they say no, then there's a respect to that. And she can clarify in a, or he or she can clarify in the, um, in the chat box. Yeah. She's, she said establishing trust so they can open up more in talking about what they need. Yep. And what we find is that, as you would imagine, they don't have one visit and open up and say everything, right? Because there's embarrassment, there's distrust, and there's a lot of complicated emotions that go into that. And so what you find is that as the relationship develops, the picture that a one of my team members have or the team has of the patient changes because they start to feel safe and they open up more each time. And so everybody works at their own pace and has comfort in different areas. And you have to accept that people aren't always able to voice what's comfortable for them. And so we have to go the extra measure, right? 
to provide that comfort and that space in a and to recognize when we need to pull pull back or when we need to do something differently. And it's very there important. Is, there is a question. What do you do if they don't want to talk about their medical condition? Um, then so you sort of become the so it's a little it's a tricky line. So if I said, Dr. Smith, um, let's, you know, let's talk about your smoking. And I don't know that Dr. Smith smokes, so nobody take that away from this. And, and, and she says, you know what, now is not a good time. I say, and she says, I don't want to talk about smoking. And I say, okay, so can I, you know, can I tell you a little bit about my perspective on smoking in general? And she may say no, or she may say yes. She'll probably say yes, because nobody keeps saying no to their doctor um, for the most part. And then when I finish the conversation, I say, um, I'm probably going to revisit this every time you come back. So I want you to think about it. Right. So I get to turn on my mother hat a little bit of you get to make your own decisions, but I'm going to push you a little bit. I'm not going to make you terribly uncomfortable, but I'm going to push you a little bit because we're going to come back to it. Now, am I going to push so much on smoking if she's using heroin? Probably not. I'm working on the heroin. Right. You pick your battles um, and you have to make sure, and this is, I think, true with everybody, when there are successes and people are resilient and they move forward to make sure that you recognize and celebrate that um, because this is a journey. Okay, first of all, I am neither using heroin nor do I smoke. And I've tried to talk my mother out of smoking my entire life. It's not going well. Yeah, um, there is you know what? Question. And there's people who are never gonna quit. And you're like, as long as you understand that these are the consequences of your actions, Mm -hmm. you get to do it and I'm still going to be by your side. It's just like your mother, right? Like, <laughs> right. And I will keep giving her grief for it, but she can correct. I'm um, gonna so there are two things in the chat. There is okay. a huge issue with patients reaching out for care with the way they have been treated from past experiences in emergency rooms and outpatient offices. Not really a question, more of a comment. And then yep. the question is, shouldn't we ask them about what they would like to talk about if they don't wanna talk about, you know. Absolutely, right? And that goes into what is your priority, right? I have my agenda, now it's all in my head, right? Because Kate's using heroin and that's high because I think she's gonna overdose. So the heroin agenda is on mine, but you know what, I'm here to help her. So what's on her agenda? And her agenda may be, you know, I want to be able to get back to work, right? And so there's a goal of, can we work on both of our agendas, right? There's a, you, the, everything is a conversation and a compromise, right? I'm here to help you, but I'm also here as an expert um, in your health. And so I'm going to share my expertise with you. And you're absolutely right. And you're absolutely right about experiences in doctor's office and emergency rooms. That's, uh, people can have just horrific experiences with those. And it's very important when you talk about teams that work with these particular folks, that they are a certain type of person. It comes within them to work with this population and they understand that everybody deserves respect and they treat everybody with respect um, and, and once people, and it's authentic, you can't make that up, right? These are authentic relationships you can't make up where at the end of an hour that you just spent with somebody and gave them their undivided attention, they're going to hug you at the end of it because they've never been treated like that before. And then everybody's in tears, but you're right. We, it, it, you have to get over those past experiences of healthcare too. And you have to prove that you're going to be different. Okay. So story one, I have to watch the time. All right, so I said I could talk about this forever. So we finished that, I have three stories here and then I have a little bit about what I've been so fortunate to do with Christiana. So I only might do a, one or two stories. No, I might only do one story and we can come back to it because I think you guys might be really interested in some of the ways we are um, changing how we do things um, to accommodate this population that before, you know, people were like, well, you either function in the traditional setting or you go somewhere else. So Chris P, um, let's see, is a 60 year old. He's not a make, he's a male. 
and he has complex medical, mental health, and substance use disorders, none of which are being treated like we talked about before. Um, or they might be treated a little bit, but not well. And the police bring him into the emergency room very frequently with confusion and alcohol intoxication. This is not an unusual story. I can tell you right now, I've got five people on my radar that come in constantly to the emergency room with alcohol intoxication, untreated medical problems that don't have help. He has high blood pressure, right? He's only 60. The older you get, 60 starts to seem young. So for all you young people out there, like he's 60, he's old. Um, I'm 55, 60, I'm like, he's young, um, right? His high blood pressure is not well controlled, and his drinking makes this worse, right? When he drinks, he doesn't take his medicines, he doesn't go to the doctors, and alcohol itself makes the blood pressure work. He drinks really heavily throughout the day, and if he doesn't, he withdraws and he has seizures. So he has to drink now, and he can't hold down a job, right? He drinks to stop hearing the voices. I tell you, it doesn't work, but that's why he says he drinks, and they're hallucinations related to his schizophrenia. And on top of all of this, right, his voices, as I told you before, are demeaning, right? They tell you how bad you are. It's like, I, I can't imagine having a voice in my head every day telling me I'm a horrible person, right? I already have those feelings sometimes on my own. Everybody has them, but I don't need somebody telling me that all of the time. And this is, these are actually a blend of patients. So actually, when I talk about this, this is a real patient, right? He's homeless and he's been assaulted in the shelter, right? Those are my folks that are living in tents. We have tent cities around Delaware where people gather and they live in tents outside because it's safer than going into the shelter system, right? So these are the patients. This is a typical patient, a patient person that we would get. And we're like, oh my gosh, right? You look at this and you go, well, he drinks, right? He's been drinking for a long time. So he probably has liver problems associated with that and some other issues. He's got high blood pressure. He's gonna have a stroke. He's gonna have a heart attack. Um, he's got untreated schizophrenia that's not really helping him out negotiate the world in any way. And that's making him feel worse about himself because the voices are awful. And he's homeless, so he has no place safe to go. He has no sanctuary. And he's been assaulted in the shelter system. And that's not unusual. You get assaulted in the shelter systems. All right. Um, oh, this guy's great, too. Um, this is a real guy. Um, ooh, this is, they're all real patients. They're all based on real patients. I'm going to read this one and then. I will go into what we've put together to work with um, these, these types of folks. So Mrs. J is a 55 year old female with uncontrolled high blood sugars, right? Lots of people have diabetes, you see it everywhere, um, but hers are way out of control and nobody can figure out what's happening and why she doesn't take her medicines and her blood pressure too. She can't figure out how to do that. And she gets admitted to the hospital with severe depression. Thank goodness she gets admitted to our psychiatric unit She's not really just depression, right? So she has schizoaffective disorder. Talk about lucky. She hears voices that demean her and has the depression on top of it. So she has both together in a combination. Um, and she had horrific trauma. I, I just, I listened to it. And thankfully I finally figured out what to say in response to these stories to say, um, so she was abandoned, physically and sexually assaulted, just treated horrifically. And I always think, and I get to the end of it, and I think, yes, but look how resilient you are. Like, look at where you've made it to in your life. Well, it turns out what nobody recognized is that she can't read, right? So we kept giving her discharge instructions, and we gave her doctor instructions, and she can't read, right? She can fake it pretty well, but she can't read. She can't read the vials. She can't read medicine. She can't read any written instructions. And she lives in a low income house where the low income high rises, drugs are everywhere. People come to your door, they have drugs. And she's 55 years old and she's smoking crack cocaine regularly, which doesn't help her schizophrenia and it doesn't help her blood pressure. Um, but this is, this is actually a real patient um, that we have worked with and we have our ups and downs. Um, for a very long time now. All right, 
So what do we do? How do we do this better, right? My goal on, in, 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 on, on this earth is to help people out. My passion is to work with these folks um, that I'm talking about, but it needs to be done differently to be successful. So we this have might, to, this might be a really good time for me to ask this question because I feel like it it will be answered in the next paragraph that you speak. How does your team make contact with these individuals? Are they referred to you afterwards for a follow up appointment, or is your team somehow integrated into the normal intake process? So mm, that's very good. So let's start with I'm going to start with the bottom one here, the Care Vio Complex Care, which has been called things over the years, but it's been in existence for eight years. And these are just community, these are wonderful community-based social workers. And I know this is a mini mental, mini medical school, but I, I mean, there's other ways to care for people. Social work is one of them. And we'll talk about community health workers too. So there's multiple ways um, to get into the profession and to really do good work, right? So this team is social workers and they go out into people's homes or meet them at McDonald's or meet them in the, under the bridge, which is a big hangout place. Um, to start to establish that relationship and to really work on the social economic piece, defining where they're at, what are their goals, how can we leverage and get them into a better financial and social state, and then uh, hook them up with um, medical care. And you ask how these people come to us. So we use, it's a no wrong door. Wow, I have no idea how red marks just showed up on there if you see them. Um, we use a no wrong door. So um, they may come from our primary care doctors or our um, specialist Christiana care. So they might refer them in. Um, part of my job is I look at complex patients in the hospital and in the emergency rooms. So I might find them and even if they're in the hospital, they're trapped. And so I can have somebody call to their bedside or go visit with them and offer the service. If they're in the emergency room, I can take a look at them and see if we can either meet them there or go after them. I also have access to some data, which will suggest to me that a person may be having the struggles, the complex set of them. Again, whole other talk. Um, and I can read through the data and start to target people and get into their charts and see if they qualify for the program. And now how do we go after them, right? So we want to do one of two things, have somebody who knows them, ask them if they wanna participate, or we want to, we'll try to call them and we'll reach out, we'll call them, leave a message. Um, we will try to figure out if we know where they're staying. Are they staying at the mission? Are they staying at the, uh, are they getting, where are they eating a manual dining room? Um, do they panhandle? Um, do they go to dialysis? They're trapped for four hours when they go to dialysis, you can find them there. Um, so we start to play the sleuthing game of how to find them. And we'll do drive-bys, which is not a very good term, um, because it sounds a little violent, but we'll go and knock on doors and we'll leave cards and messages, right? And our goal is to say, hey, listen, we haven't gone away, right? They get calls from lots of people, um, but we're still here. And, e and sometimes they don't, well, they don't engage with us. If they don't engage with us, we'll be like, can I check on you in a month? Um, or if they totally, totally, totally don't want anything, we'll say, here's my phone number. Um, and we have people call us back that way. Um, we, there's some eligibility criteria, again, not getting into it, um, but I try really hard to work in the gray and try to serve as many people as possible. And you know what, if somebody's referred to us and we're not the right referral place, we don't just say no, we figure out the right referral place and help the person get there, right? You have to complete the, 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 you know, the, the cycle. You don't just say no and turn somebody out right? You're like, that's not okay. We're the experts. We need to help you. So, um, so quick question. <laughs> is this program open to Pennsylvania residents with Pennsylvania Medicaid, only Delaware? You know, who's available? Okay. So right now, um, this program is open to 
So Christiana takes financial risk for patients. And it's open to Delaware Medicaid where Christiana takes financial risk, um, some Medicare, and then some other commercial insurances. We'll get into it. So, um, so it's one of those insurances, Delaware, uh, Pennsylvania Medicaid is not in that, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, or we'll take a patient that has a Christiana care piece, primary care doctor or family doctor, because we will not leave our own primary care doctors stranded alone to work with a patient that they don't have the support to do so. So we won't do that. Um, we also will take any patient that's in the Hope Center, um, which is the Sheraton on 95 that was, I don't know, something else before that, that just opened up and houses homeless folks. Um, and we also work with the Newcastle County Behavioral Health Unit that we work with. Um, and again, if people call us, we will try to, if we can't serve them, figure out where to go. And then two quick follow-up questions. What happens if someone refuses to accept your help? And at what point do you give up helping folks that rebuff all your efforts? Um, so what we do with them, we don't actually ever give up on them. Um, I guess maybe if they're violent and we feel threatened and we can't work with them, but we've not really had that in the eight years that this has been open. Um, but what we'll do, we're sort of the irritating mothers, right? So I'll put you in what I call a monitoring program where I'm not calling you, but every time you show up to the ED, I'm calling you then and I'm going to say, hey, how are your decisions working for you? Right? Because what I'm waiting for is some change in their life that may inspire them to get help right? But they can still say no. And I'll be like, okay, I'll just call you the next time you show up again, right? We don't ever give up on people. Um, we just don't. So there's one more, and then we're going to let you keep talking because this still has to do with those last questions. Okay. For folks with serious mental illness or serious um, substance use disorder or co-occurring issues and are homeless, how do you keep the connection with all those individuals? Are you aware of any programs that provide housing support to those who are seriously seeking help but do not have a safe or stable place to stay? Oh, yeah, housing is a nightmare. Um, the other thing I haven't talked about here is that we do not, in either one of these programs, do it alone. We're in constant relationship with all of the folks who are in the state programming throughout the state and with the community-based organizations, the friendship houses, those folks, right? Because it takes all of us and our skill levels to do it. Um, housing is a nightmare. Um, and the, so it takes probably about nine months to house somebody um, in Delaware, which means we're usually stuck about nine months um, trying to support somebody in a different situation. Um, and so we have to, that, that we cobble together piece by piece. We may support somebody who's in a shelter. We've supported people living in their car for nine months through the winter. Um, we will try to figure out and cobble something together while we go through the different avenues to try to find housing. Um, but housing, I have to tell you, if we can make a difference in, in, in any way, it would be affordable and safe housing um, because once you're safe in home, it, it's much easier to, 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 to self-care. Um, but it, we have to figure out, I can't tell you the number of people we've supported living in their vehicle that doesn't run, that's parked on somebody's property. Um, through the winters in Delaware or in a tent. We've supported people in their tents as well. So, so then this is actually, I'm gonna just move on. So this is the last thing. So the new piece is the Center for Hope and Healing. And the Center for Hope and Healing sort of came out of the complex care work we were doing in the community with social workers. We now have nurses in the community as well. Um, to say, you know, we were driving ourselves crazy trying to take somebody who was suffering and struggling and then get them here for their primary care, their family doctor, and get them here for their psychiatry, and get them here for their therapy, and get them here for their housing, and get them here for their food banks, right? We were like, we were like, it was just too hard, and it took like three years. We couldn't, wasn't efficient. So we went to the institution and said, listen, we want to develop the Center for Hope and Healing, which is what it ended up calling. 
And the Center for Hope and Healing is really cool. And it's only, gosh, it'll be two years in July that it'll be two years old. And in one setting, it is primary care doctor, right? So family doctor who loves working with this population, right? A psychiatric provider, nurse practitioner, loves working with these folks, right? The therapist who's amazing, everyone should have therapy with Cassandra. A social worker who does, knows the ins and outs and the complexities of all of the um, available resources. And a community health worker who's also a drug and alcohol counselor. Um, and then we have supporting staff, two nurses and a case manager, we have supporting staff. And what we do with these folks when they come in is all of your things are now at one site, right? And well, we actually have three sites now, um, but they're all located together. They all talk together. They're all working to figure out how to support you in the best way possible. And so you might come in and when people come to us, they may have therapy twice a week for a few weeks. And then they see the psychiatrist. They might not have any real medical problems, but they get a full physical and they get all of their vaccinations while they're there. Um, and a social worker meets with them and then they disappear and they go away. But then we send Lewis, our community health worker out after them to find them because a lot of times they just get embarrassed because they relapse um, and bring them back in. And we follow up with people and we, we will even go to an appointment with them. We set up transportation. Uh, we just wrap around them, um, particularly when they first come in um, and, and, and support them in every way. Now you can be in the program short term, six to nine months where you get stabilized and you go back to your own primary care doctor, you go to another supportive environment that's not us, or you can stay with us long-term in what we call complex care primary care. And we started that in the Wilmington Hospital to begin with. Um, and it was really fun, right? But, you know, people don't show up, they show up late, but all the schedules are adjusted. They don't look like regular doctor's office schedules to accommodate crisis, to accommodate lateness, to accommodate, accommodate walk-ins, right? Those are all okay. We will accommodate all of those and we will not give up on you. We will not fire you from the practice unless you're violent. Um, and we will figure out how to work with you. We will talk to you by telephone. We will talk to you by virtual visit. We'll help set you up with a virtual visit. We'll help you get a phone. Um, we'll certainly see you face to face. We've seen face to face through the whole pandemic, except for the first two or three months. Um, we then had a Wilmington hospital visit. Uh, sorry, Wilmington Hospital site. Then we have a Riverside site up where, um, off of Miller Road, where the old, um, used to be a nursing home facility that Christiana Care owned, but it's up by uh, Home Depot that's up off of Miller Road. And then we just moved into the Hope Center. So we have three sites as well. Um, and it, we get crazy creative with meeting these folks and their needs. Um, and the institution where a normal primary care office might have 20 minutes to see a patient, um, the Center for Hope and Healing schedules on the hour. Again, it's to be able to accommodate phone calls and walk-ins and chaos and, you know, craziness um, that, that goes on where if you had a patient every 15 or 20 minutes, you don't have the capability to take them in without really stressing the system. And the care of these individuals, right? There's a lot of trauma to the teams that take care of these patients, right? Every day you're just watching such pain um, that it requires self-care and team care around it as well. So we have to watch our teams, uh, watch who might be getting a little burned out. We take turns. Um, uh, when things get like really crisis-y um, and uh, it, it's a very particular team. They're very skilled at what they do um, and they will step in when somebody taps out and says, I need to walk away for an hour. We're like, go walk away for an hour. Like it's fine. So we can come back and be the best that we can do to work with these individuals. Okay. So that was actually, and I made it with six minutes to spare. There's my, my, I know I'm totally psyched. There's my email. 
I think it's spelled right. If you have any questions, you know, I'm happy to answer by email. Um, but we have five minutes, although I didn't let anybody take a break. I'm so sorry. That's um, okay. If we had taken a break, you would have gone over. So I know. You're good. All right. Um, there are three questions in the chat. Okay. Um, the Hope and Healing Center, do they provide family therapy sessions? Um, they do to the people that are in it. We, you can't come into the Center for Hope and Healing and just receive part of the Center for Hope and Healing, right? If you just need family therapy, you just go to Mid-Atlantic. Yeah, I mean, lots of people do that. Um, but Cassandra can do couples and some, she'll do some family sessions as well. And each one of these teams, I didn't tell you. So if one family member qualifies for the team, then we'll take on other family members as well because you can't treat one person and have the others remain unhealthy. The dynamic doesn't work that way. Um, and so we will work with families or spouse, whatever, however somebody defines family um, to right, lift them up as a unit. And then where is the Hope Center? Okay, so the Hope Center is not the Center for Hope and Healing. We named ours first. The Center for Hope and Healing <laughs> is those three places. The Hope Center is on 95 off of 141. And it is the old, for those of you that like keep up with the whole history, the Capano built hotel that wasn't built to specs and then got sold once and then was sold to the Sheraton. It's in the worst place ever for a hotel. I, I don't even know how that happened, but it went up to auction last year um, in October and the county bought it and um, Friendship House um, with the county runs it. And it is transitional housing um, like other shelters, um, but it is, you can stay there, you get three meals a day, you have to stay in your room. I mean, it's not a party there, um, but it particularly caters to families, brings families in. Um, and so it's new and you can go look on the county site under the Hope Center or Friendship House because um, the teams are doing really remarkable work there. Um, how do you care for people who might be violent? Yeah, um, so we've only had one patient um, that's been violent, not in the community. If they're violent in the community, we don't meet them in the community. I can't put staff at risk, um, but we can meet them in safer situations. Um, but there's a difference between somebody who's, we treated somebody who could easily have gotten violent um, but we sort of figured a way, first of all, we've all been trained in what to do in violent situations, right? They're all trained, not that we ever want to use it. We'll see them only at the Wilmington Hospital setting because we have access to constables. And um, you don't see them alone. There'll be multiple of us together. And this one gentleman, I swear that we've had one, um, we figured out that if we, we give people snacks too, we feed them and we give them drinks because, you know, they traveled and they don't have access. And so we provide snacks. And if we gave him a granola bar in each hand and let him walk around, he was able to diffuse his own anger. Um, and in fact, we had the constables called a couple of times, but we left them outside because we thought they would make it worse. Um, but if they're really violent, then I get on the phone with the behavioral health, um, Newcastle County behavioral health. And there are other ways to bring somebody into behavioral health treatment, whether willingly or against their will. Um, and we'll reach out and start have conversations with the folks that who can do it against people's will um, to bring them in and give them the opportunity to be treated. It's not fun, but there are other options. That's amazing. And you do excellent work. Um, unfortunately, there are some more questions in the chat, but since we're at time, I'm going to say if your question did not get answered, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Bonner at the yep. uh, email that's on the screen right now. Yep. That would be great. And then well, that Dr. Was Bonner, awesome. yeah, awesome. if you want to stop screen sharing, um, I think Tim has the website up for something, the Hope Center, maybe. I don't know. Did I do that? Did I stop sharing? You didn't, but that's okay. You can do it. Now you've done it. Excellent. Now you've gone and done it. <laughs> All righty. Okay, hopefully everybody sees the, sees the Delaware Mini Medical School website. Dr. Bonner, thank you so much. Uh, folks, this is where 
uh, here we have the session today and below this will, there will be the uh, PowerPoint and there will also be once we compile it the video from this evening's session. Uh, next week, timely as always, we're going to have uh, Tim Bowers giving a COVID-19 update and that really will be the most up-to-date information that's come from the CDC and the National Institutes of Health and so on. So we will see you all next week. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Take care.